was uh, in Afghanistan's capital in Kabul in 2013 and 2014. Uh, I assisted in organising uh, an Anzac Day service for uh, deployed Australian and New Zealand forces in, uh, in April of 2014. And as I was uh, preparing uh, that uh, particular service, we were paid a, a visit, and I think it was the day before the service, I think it was on the 24th of April, from an Australian Major General, a particular Australian Major General, who was at that time also deployed with an international contingent who were overseeing coalition uh, operations. And as this uh, Major General uh, walked into the hangar where the service was to be conducted, he immediately, without taking a breath, proceeded to dress down all of those who were wearing Australian uniforms. And for whatever reason, this particular Major General, he felt he needed to assert his authority to ensure that everything was done in a certain way. And quite obviously, the way that he felt it needed to be conducted was his way. And so there was no greeting, there was no introduction, there was no advance warning that he was coming. There was no discussion of expectations with either myself or with anyone else who was uh, there uh, organising the service in a private setting. And so what he had to say was done in full view, Turkish, New Zealand, US, British, Canadian forces, and it left no one in any doubt as to who was in charge. He was the man. When he spoke, everyone listened. And so what exactly was it that the good general was doing? Well, he was making a very clear statement, wasn't he? He was making a very clear statement about his authority. And what we have here in the passage before us this morning is a very public display of Jesus' authority. Now, some historians have estimated that as many as two and a quarter million people would have flocked to the temple in Jerusalem during Passover in the first century before the temple was finally raised to the ground. And so Jesus clearly isn't afraid, is he, of making a very public spectacle. Jesus isn't afraid of what it is that people might think of him. And Jesus would have been very well aware that his actions invited a whole range of responses, not least of all resentment and opposition. Of course, that is not what Jesus sought, is it? But it is, church, what he sometimes did receive. Jesus is not interested, you see, in simply being liked. Jesus' aim is, is not to be popular. Jesus' only interest is in bringing men and women, in, in reconciling men and women to the God that they are estranged from. And if that means that he has to confront us, if that means, church, that he has to upset us, then that is most certainly what Jesus will do. And so Jesus is making a statement, isn't he? Jesus is making a very clear statement. This church is a story that is all about authority. And so before we have a, a closer look at, at this passage before us, I'd invite you to pray with me. Let's, let's pray. Uh, Father God, we thank you that we can learn a great deal as we come into your word about what makes us tick. We thank you that when we read your word, we can see what real authority looks like and we can measure authority in the world by it. I ask, Lord, that as we come to your word this morning that you would give us 
ears to hear what it is that you would say to us, that we would have soft hearts, even as we read about those things from the book of Ezekiel. Lord, help us in hearing your word this morning to leave this place knowing that we have done business with you and that you and your spirit have done business with us. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, uh, we do know that uh, this is a story about authority because we're actually told as much in verse 18, aren't we? The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Now, authority, as far as the Bible is concerned, is, is terribly important. It's a consistent theme, as a matter of fact, throughout Scripture, throughout both the Old and the New Testaments. The theme of authority comes up uh, again and again. Why is it that Moses led God's people? Does Moses lead God's people because he, he chose to do that? Did he take upon that authority himself? Not at all. Moses leads God's people. He, he, he does so because God enables him to do so. God has given him the authority to lead God's people. He had God's stamp of, of approval. And the same is true of Joshua and, and all of the judges. It's true of David and it's true of David's son, Solomon, God himself raised them up to lead and to defeat the enemy of God's people. And so the Jews, when they, when they come to Jesus, they, they rightly ask him, by what authority, Jesus, are you doing what it is that you are doing? And notice where it is that Jesus then directs them. He, he directs them to his death and resurrection. That's where Jesus directs them. Destroy this temple, says Jesus, and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you are going to raise it in three days? And just to be sure that we've not missed the point that Jesus is here making, John then adds, the temple that he had spoken of was his body. In other words, Everything that, that I've done and everything that I'm yet to do will be verified, says Jesus, when? When you kill me and when I rise again. Now, you cannot listen to what Jesus has just said and, and not take what he has said seriously. You, you can test my words and you, and you can test my actions, says Jesus, by what happens to me after I'm dead. If you kill me and I stay dead, <laughs> don't listen to me. Don't listen to anything that I've got to say. Everything I've said about myself and, and, and everything that anyone else says about me stands and falls, says Jesus, upon whether or not I stay dead. Now, if you don't like Jesus, or if you don't believe Jesus, then all you have to do, and all anyone has to do, is, is put his lifeless corpse on display. That's all they had to did, do. Display his body, and Jesus is proved to be nothing but a fraud. Now, in anyone's estimation, those who oppose Jesus, they are the ones, are they not, who, who hold all the aces. If death holds him, now listen to this, because this is what Jesus is saying. If death holds him, then he is a liar. If, on the other hand, death is unable to hold him, then, then what he says and what he does really does need to be taken seriously. That's the challenge that Jesus presents. Everything, and, and I do mean everything is against him. All they have to do is kill him and display his lifeless body. That's all they have to do. No more questions. No more doubt. No more Jesus. 
But here's the thing, church. They couldn't do it. Those who claimed to have authority, they couldn't do it. That's all they had to do. And they couldn't do it. Well, they killed him, sure enough. And they buried him. But what they couldn't do, church, was display his lifeless body. They couldn't do it, church, because there was no dead body to display, was there? They killed him. But he didn't stay dead. Now, the reason I say that is to clarify to anyone who has doubts concerning who Jesus is, and, and perhaps that's you this morning, I don't know, or online, perhaps that's you. And if that is you, the place to look for Jesus, can I just say this, is not the church. The place to look for Jesus is not the church. You see, the church will inevitably let you down. The church says, says one thing and it does something else. Is that not true? You know that's true. It's filled with scoundrels. You want to find a scoundrel? Come to church. There's plenty of them. It always has been filled with them. You should be able to look at the church and see Jesus. And yet, sadly, that is not always true. Nor should you primarily look at Jesus' followers. If you're looking for a reason to believe in Jesus, don't look in the first instance to his disciples. You will always find disciples who will let you down. Did you know that standing behind the pulpit in a great many places of worship are people who have never even met Jesus? Did you know that? It's true. They don't know who Jesus is. They think they know, but they don't. Their lives haven't been changed. Their, their thinking is futile. And, and what they preach, quite frankly, is nonsense. Nor should you look at science. Science has proved a great many things, but, but one thing it cannot prove is that Jesus is God. No, it cannot disprove it either, but it cannot prove it. What does prove it, church, is the resurrection. That's what proves it. Beyond all reasonable doubt, the resurrection of Jesus supports everything that he ever said and everything that he ever did. The truth, church, is this. If you don't believe, it's only because you've been looking in all the wrong places. If you don't believe, it's only because you've been looking in all the wrong places. Look in the tomb. Look in the tomb. All his opponents had to do was produce his body. One job. I say that to my kids all the time. Do the dishes. One job. <laughs> they do the dishes, by the way. That's all the authorities had. One job. And church, they couldn't do it. And the reason they couldn't do it was because Jesus rose again. And so did Jesus have authority to do what he did? Well, you look at the resurrection and you tell me. Because that's what Jesus is saying. And so that's the first point that John would like everyone to understand. Does Jesus have a God-given authority to lead God's people? What? right does he have to claim to speak for God and Jesus says look in the tomb look at the resurrection that's what Jesus says and so that's point number one let me now make very briefly three other points the first and perhaps the most obvious has to do with where this particular story sits now this particular story sits right beside Another story, it was the story that we had a look at last week, in fact, it's a story about a wedding. And we, we, we saw that last week, as I said, didn't we? And it's a very different kind of story. Last week, what we saw was how it was that Jesus was celebrated. His glory resulted in great joy. In this story, however, 
what Jesus does, well, it isn't celebrated. In this story, Jesus confronts people. And in, and in this story, what, what Jesus says and does, well, it isn't actually received very well at all. There is pushback, isn't there? There is pushback and there is opposition. And it really is a contrast. And, and it's really important that we see that because that's exactly what it is that we are meant to see. Jesus, uh, John, I should say, he, he wants us to see that. And so what we have here, church, sitting side by side are two stories and two responses. And sitting at the centre of both of them is one man. And it's interesting, isn't it, that in the first story we have an allusion to two covenants, don't we? we? We have the Old Testament or the Old Covenant and the New. Whilst in the second story we have two temples. We, we have those who are, who are stuck in the old, those who are stuck in the old way of doing things, the old way of, of thinking, old structures and old traditions. And we have those who are surprised by and delighted with the new, new wine, new joy, a, a new reason to celebrate. And at the centre of it all is who? Well, at the centre of it all is Jesus. Jesus is, on the one hand, the reason for our joy. Whilst on the other, he's the reason that people get upset and even, even angry. Jesus embraces people, doesn't he? We, we, we see that in the first story. He, he puts his arms around people and they celebrate with him. But Jesus also holds people to account. That's the Jesus of, of the Bible. There are always two sides. And as a result of that, people either love him or they hate him. People either love him or hate him. And so we see two covenants, two sets of people and two responses. We also see two sides of Jesus, don't we? It's not enough, you see, that we content ourselves with Jesus only when he brings us joy. Only when he, he turns our, our water into wine. It's lovely when he does, of course. But Jesus is also the one who clears the temple. He, he says things that at times we don't want to hear. Is that not true? Sometimes he says things to you, if you know him, that you do not want to hear. Because he's a living God. He confronts us, doesn't he? Because unless he confronts us, we cannot begin to change. Unless he, he confronts us, you know what we'll begin to think? We'll begin to think we're okay. That's what we'll begin to think. And so Jesus has to confront us. You see, we cannot accept that our actions and our thoughts and our, and our words are offensive to the one he has come to to reconcile us to God. And so Jesus confronts us. And sometimes it's a word of judgment that Jesus brings, as it is in this particular story. And so sometimes we're going to see, aren't we, that the world is full of corporate blindness and arrogance and a refusal to listen to what he has to say. You see, that's sometimes what, what power does to people. It's what power did to the authorities in the first century. Sometimes what power does is, is, is it blinds them. It, it causes them to become arrogant. And church, we've seen it, haven't we? Time and time again throughout history. Governments that begin with the best interests of those they serve at heart, unless challenged and humbled in time, they often become arrogant, don't they? And they become blind to their own sin. And sometimes the word that Jesus brings is not to corporations or to governments or to authorities. Sometimes the word that Jesus brings actually is, is very, well, it's very personal. You see, not only does Jesus confront corporate sin, he, he confronts individual sin. And so what Jesus does he, is he reveals our sin to us. God's word uncovers some truth that we'd prefer not to look at. 
And so rather than than own it and repent of it and, and seek forgiveness for it, what do we do? Well, we turn away often when we're left to ourselves. We we try and hide. And unless we allow him to address it, we remain stuck, don't we? Unable to move forward because the weight of our sin is just too heavy. And so, yes, Jesus comes to celebrate. Of course he does. He frees us and so we celebrate and he celebrates with us. But, but Jesus also comes to confront us. The second thing that I'd like us to notice, notice is the patience Jesus shows. The patience Jesus shows. And we see that beginning in verse 22. There we read this. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. And so not even Jesus' own disciples had a clue what it was that Jesus was talking about. Here's these, 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 these men who, who, who know Jesus perhaps better than anyone else. And they haven't got a clue. They haven't got a clue what he's talking about. And they didn't understand what he was talking about until when? Well, they didn't understand what he was talking about until he, until he rose again. That's what Jesus here says. And that's the thing about Jesus, isn't it? One thing you learn, and if you don't learn it, then you should learn it. I want you to think about this. One thing you learn about Jesus is that he's not in a rush with us. Jesus is in a rush with us. He, he doesn't expect that those who follow him are going to understand everything that, that he says the first time that he says it. He's, he's not quick to get angry with them for their inability to grasp what he is talking about or, or, or who he really is. On the contrary, Jesus is patient with them. He carries them along, doesn't he? We may think that we're persevering. Jesus is the one who perseveres. Jesus, you see, he, he knows our frailties, doesn't he? Jesus knows, he, he recognises our inconsistencies and the extent of our ignorance. But, but one thing that Jesus is not is in a hurry. He doesn't explode, does he? In a, in a moment of frustration because of the disciples' slowness to grasp even that which seems most obvious. He doesn't explode. He doesn't get angry with them. You see, Jesus is like us. But he's nothing at all like us. Jesus is like us, but he's nothing at all like us. He's the God who is gentle with us. He's the God who who changes us one moment at a time, one behaviour at a time. He, he changes us, doesn't he? One inconsistency at a time, one failure at a time, one sin at a time. And so take encouragement from that because Jesus will not, he will not push you. What he will do is he'll walk alongside of you. That's what Jesus does. And eventually, church, you begin to see him as he truly is. And so Jesus is patient. He's not weak. He's not tolerant. He's gentle. And he's patient. And finally, Jesus knows us better than we know ourselves. Look with me at at verse 23 and following. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs that he was performing and and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. Jesus knows you, and Jesus knows me, better than we know ourselves. Jesus knows you and Jesus knows me better than we know ourselves. 
each person who is sitting here this morning and each person who is, is watching online uh, should know that Jesus knows them. Whether you know him or not, whether you bend the knee or not, Jesus knows you. And, and Jesus, because he knows you, he, he, he doesn't entrust himself to you. He, he doesn't place his reputation, in other words, in your hands. He doesn't place his prospects in your hands. He, he doesn't place his future in your hands. And the reason he doesn't do it is because, well, quite frankly, we have a habit, don't we, of getting in the way, don't we? I know I do. One day we believe. Next day we don't. One day we're Jesus' champion. Next day we're embarrassed. One day we understand. Next day we don't. One day we are determined to follow. The next we don't. That's your story. That's my story. Jesus knows us. And so what does he do? Well, rather than placing himself in, in our hands, in, in, instead he calls us to place ourselves in his. That's what Jesus does. He knows us. And so what does he do? Well, rather than placing himself in our hands, instead he calls us to place ourselves in his. And church, it really is the safest place to be because it's in his hands that we find rest. In his hands we find comfort. In his hands we find grace. And in his hands we can, we can stop worrying about life and we can start living for him. And so what is it that we see in this story? Well, the first thing we see in this story is Jesus' authority. Jesus has a God-given authority. And we also see that that authority divides people. There are, there are those who celebrate Jesus and there are those who, who don't celebrate Jesus. There are those who follow Jesus and there are those who, who don't. And, and we see that, that Jesus is patient with those who choose to follow. And, and we see that Jesus knows us better than we even know ourselves. And let me finish this morning by making an inference that I think that this particular passage would endorse. And I want to say that this is in no way the focus of this particular passage, but it is an inference that is supported by uh, this passage and by everything that we read of in both the Old and the New Testaments. What killed Jesus, that which led him to the cross, was his zeal for God's house. And we see that, don't we, in verse 17. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. And here's the inference, church, that I want to make. And uh, I think it's, a, it's an important inference. So uh, I'll have it up on the screen for you to read uh, as I say it. And that inference is this. Jesus' zeal, Jesus' love for God and for God's house, for God's kingdom, in other words, God's righteousness, God's honour and God's people, Jesus' love, his, his zeal, his total affection and complete submission to God and all that God is, just as that led him ultimately to the cross, so to our love for God and God's house, God's righteousness, God's honour and God's people, our zeal, in other words, our total affection and complete submission to God and, and to all that God is, just as it led Jesus to the cross, so too will it lead us to the cross. Not the cross that only Jesus could die on, not his cross, church, but our own cross. You see, church, to be sold out to the one true God, the way that, the way that Jesus was sold out to the one true God, <laughs> can lead you only to one place. When you are sold out to the one true God, the world will not understand you. The world will think that there is something wrong with you. The world may even think, church, that you've lost your mind. The world, because it hates God, it hates being told that it is guilty, it hates being told that it is answerable to the one who made them, the world hates being told that God isn't pleased with it and that God is going to judge it. And church, because the world finds that kind of language offensive, 
It will hate everyone who believes in it and it will hate everyone who proclaims it. And just as Jesus knew that it would lead him to the cross, Christians need to understand that it will lead them also to a cross. Now that's not the message of this particular story. But you cannot read this story and not see that that's what awaits everyone who, like Jesus, has a zeal for God's house. Pick up your cross and follow me, says Jesus. And church, that's one of the reasons why we need each other. It's one of the reasons that God has called us to live in community. It's hard to live in the world knowing that to do so is going to invite the world's scorn and to invite the world's ridicule. When people fail to understand you because you choose to live for God and no longer for yourself, to gather alongside others who believe what it is that you believe and who love God the way that you love God is one of the reasons, church, that God calls us together principally to declare his praises and to witness to the world that we belong to him, but also to encourage one another, to pick each other up and to spur one another on and to not lose hope whilst we carry our cross and the world looks on and laughs. More and more, church, that is what I long to see and my prayer is that more and more God's people will become what God wants them to be. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you for your word. We thank you that we see in this story the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Such authority. And we thank you, Lord, that indeed when we look at the tomb, it is empty. And his resurrection proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that he is worthy of our loyalty and that he is worthy of our praise. And Lord, we thank you that you hear us because we come to you in Jesus' name. Amen.